welcome everyone. This is a special evening where we are going to honor the life and achievements of Dr. Arthur Laffer. For those of you I've not yet had the opportunity to meet, I'm Jennifer Schubert Aiken. I'm the chairman, CEO, and co-founder of the Steamboat Institute, along with my husband, Rick Aiken, um, who is with me here tonight, also a co-founder. Um, we founded the Steamboat Institute. For those of you who don't know much about our organization, we founded the Steamboat Institute in Steamboat Springs in 2008. And I just heard someone mention the Aspen Institute, or Aspen, and we actually founded the Steamboat Institute to be a conservative alternative to the Aspen Institute. Okay, well, thank you. Steamboat Institute is proud to promote America's founding principles and to inspire people to actively defend liberty. We do this by providing ordinary citizens, just like all of us, with direct and personal access to our nation's leaders in conservative, free market thought and policy. In late August, we will be hosting our 14th annual Freedom Conference at the Park Hyatt, right here in beautiful Beaver Creek, uh, this will be the third year that this, the Freedom Conference has been here in Beaver Creek, and uh, we're very pleased that this has given us the opportunity to grow our event. Um, our Freedom Conference draws people from all over America. We have leaders in the past, uh, including last year, we have Mike Pompeo. We've had Jason Riley and other members of the Wall Street Journal editorial board, Laura Ingram. Uh, Dr. Carol Swain, just a, you know, a who's who of conservative free market leadership. This year's Freedom Conference, which is set for August 26th and 27th, will feature John Rich, country music superstar and host of The Pursuit on Fox Business Network. He will speak and perform at the keynote dinner. We also have confirmed Charles Payne, host of Making Money with Charles Payne on Fox Business Network. We will have Jillian Melcher from the Wall Street Journal talking about her experiences reporting from Ukraine since the Russian invasion. She is actually in Ukraine right now. So her stories um, are just fascinating from being there on the ground talking to people. And we will also have Ilya Shapiro, Director of Constitutional Studies for the Manhattan Institute, um, who recently left Georgetown Law School. If you were following that story, it was a major case of cancel culture, and Ilya Shapiro will be speaking. We also have many more exciting speaker announcements with names you would recognize, but I cannot say them yet because we don't have them quite yet confirmed. So go to steamboatinstitute.org um, to get all the information on that. Not only does the Steamboat Institute offer the best speakers in the most beautiful setting right here in Beaver, Beaver Creek, but I'm pretty sure we're the only public policy conference in the country to feature a live outdoor concert and a Coyote Gold margarita party. So you won't want to miss that. So register at steamboatinstitute.org. Also, if you are a student or young professional between the ages of 18 and 29, or if you know someone who is, we have a scholarship to attend the Freedom Conference that young people can apply for. The scholarship deadline is this Friday, June 17th at midnight mountain time. It's a great opportunity for young people to attend the Freedom Conference. It includes air if they're out of state, lodging for three nights at the Park Hyatt, conference registration, and most important, the opportunity to meet and personally interact with our speakers. Uh, one of my favorite photos from last year's Freedom Conference was all of the, the 25 to 30 young leaders who were here on scholarships gathered around Secretary Pompeo. It was, it was pretty special. As a nonprofit, nonpartisan educational organization, Steamboat Institute relies on the support of many generous individuals, businesses, and foundations to fulfill our mission of educating people on our founding principles and persuading them of the value of these principles which champion individual liberty and inspire people to reach their fullest potential. I would like to thank our major foundation sponsors which include the Jack Roth Charitable Foundation, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, the Anschutz Foundation, Adolph Coors Foundation, and the El Pomar Foundation. And I would also like to say a special thanks to Alexia and Jerome Jershak and Rod and Olivia Miller for helping to make this evening's program possible. We very much appreciate our donors. 
Steamboat Institute has had the distinct pleasure of hosting a few events with Dr. Laffer over the past few years. In the fall of 2020, we hosted one of our campus Liberty Tour debates at Middle Tennessee State University, featuring Dr. Laffer and Democrat strategist Leslie Marshall discussing whether a wealth tax and higher ta income taxes will increase prosperity. Yes, she actually argued that they would. Um, then at last year's Freedom Conference here in Beaver Creek, we hosted a fascinating panel discussion with Dr. Laffer and our governor, Jared Polis, on unleashing prosperity at the state level. We are fortunate that our governor has the wisdom to seek the advice of Dr. Laffer on matters of fiscal and economic policy, and I think you can see that reflected in some of the decisions that Governor Polis makes. Finally, before I introduce our speakers, I would like to encourage you to submit questions for Brian and Dr. Laffer by using the QR code on the cards that were handed to you as you walked in. You can submit questions throughout the presentation and about, what, 30 minutes or so before the end tonight. Um, I will be reading your questions on a tablet as you are submitting them, and then I will choose the questions to ask of Dr. Laffer and Brian. So, so get, enter, submit those questions as you think of them, and we'll try to ask as many as we can. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers. Since 1972, 50 years ago, Dr. Arthur Laffer has been the single most important influencer of U.S. economic policy. Dr. Laffer's economic acumen and influence triggered a worldwide tax-cutting movement in the 1980s, including in the UK, where he advised Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher on fiscal policy. Dr. Laffer has advised nine US presidents on economic policy, and as a member of President Reagan's Economic Policy Advisory Board for both of Reagan's terms in the 1980s, Dr. Laffer created the theory of supply-side economics resulting in the most prosperous period of economic growth in U.S. history. His Laffer curve, clearly illustrating the trade-off between tax rates and actual tax revenues, revolutionized the understanding of these concepts. In a nutshell, Arthur Laffer is responsible for much of the prosperity and opportunity created in America over the last 50 years. Dr. Laffer has received too many awards and honors to mention all of them, but an especially notable honor was the Presidential Medal of Freedom awarded to Dr. Laffer in 2019 by President Trump. I strongly encourage you to buy the book they're going to discuss this evening, The Emergence of Arthur Laffer. If you've not already bought one, they will be available for sale um, upstairs again after the event, and they will be signing uh, books after, after the program tonight. But this book is really a fascinating chronicle of the rise of Dr. Laffer and his influence on economic policy here in the U.S. and around the world. The author of this great book is Brian Dimitrovic. Brian is the Richard S. Strong Scholar at the Laffer Center in Nashville and a professor of history at Sam Houston State University. He was previously a visiting scholar in conservative thought and policy at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I'm proud to serve with Brian on the advisory board for the Bruce Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at CU. Brian earned his PhD from Harvard and is a regular contributor to Forbes on fiscal and economic policy. He's also the author of another book that will be coming out just a little later this year called Taxes Have Consequences, an Income Tax History of the United States, which he co-authored with Dr. Laffer. And you can pre-order that book now. I encourage you once again to buy a copy, have it signed after tonight's program. And now before our speakers begin, we have a very brief video clip for your enjoyment. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, a tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs, in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? 
it says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. And with that, thanks to Ben Stein and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Dr. Arthur Laffer and Brian Dimitrovic. Isn't she something? It's just amazing that the, the um, it's fun to be here with all of you. In fact, I haven't been up here in really quite a while. I used to come up all the time when, with, uh, with uh, uh, Ford and Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld. And we, I mean, right here, literally. I mean, there. We have, I'm going to discuss first, I'm going to discuss Taxes Have Consequences, which is the book that is coming out. It should be out September 15th, 20th, something like that, Brian. It will be out. And what it is, it is a history of the U.S. income tax from 1913 to the present. Uh, we, the income tax was deemed unconstitutional time and time again in our history. And so it had to have a separate constitutional amendment uh, that was put in. I think it was started by Taft when it passed through all the states and got the legislatures. It was the 16th Amendment. And as soon as it became law and constitutional, uh, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, did his wonderful thing, was introduced the income tax, 1913. At that time, before I go into this, the highest rate was 7%. And it applied to about, what, 385,000 people. Uh, there were 62 million adults at the time, and there were 385,000 people to whom it applied. So it, beep, beep, at the very tippy top, the wealthiest of the wealthy were the only ones being taxed. Now, the concept I want to start off with, and it's really very, very important that, um, that I go through this concept carefully. Oh, I'm gonna, I promised you a joke first. Didn't I? Oh, yeah, was well, see, coming, driving up here, and I mean, it is really beautiful up here. I mean, the air's a little thin, in contrast to me. Um, the... Um, but coming up here, you see the mountains, and you see all the trees, and you see all the beauty of that. And there's some snow still left up in the mountaintops. And I was reminded of a very liberal atheist professor from Harvard University who uh, you know, loved doing the social issues there at Harvard, but then in the summer would love to come birding here in Colorado. I mean, he was an avid birder. And he lived dressed in his little jodhpurs, you know, like that. And he had his little knapsack on and his little thing there and glasses. And he'd go up to these alpine meadows uh, around here. And one time he was in this meadow looking for birds. And he had his glasses on looking across the meadow. And all of a sudden he saw on the far side of the meadow this huge grizzly bear. Well, not only did he see the grizzly bear, but the grizzly bear also saw him. And the grizzly, they met eyes, and it was, the race was on. The grizzly bear was, came right across the meadow, full speed. You know how they are, um, 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 like that. He panicked. He panicked. He started screaming and running and going away, uh, ran away as fast as he could. And soon he started hearing the breath um, um, coming closer and closer. He wasn't out running this bear. And just when he felt, I mean, he almost felt the hot breath on him, he tripped and fell and landed flat on his back and looked up. And there was this huge grizzly bear with teeth there, drool, all the bad breath <laughs> over him. And he said, oh, dear Lord, forgive me for being an atheist, please. Oh, God, please make this bear a Christian. And with that, there was a clap of thunder. And the bear stopped in midair and dropped to his knees right before this man. And brought his paws together dropping right down in front of the guy and brought his big paws together and said, Dear Lord, please bless this meal that I'm about to receive in Christ's name. <laughs> Is that okay? The, let, me, let me, if I can, start. I, I do want to have some fun with you. I'm going to go through some charts here with you. The first concept I really want to get through is incentives. Taxes are really, really important, but they are not why people choose not to work. They are not why people choose to work. People don't work to pay taxes. People work to get what they can after tax. 
It's that very personal and very private incentive that motivates someone to quit one job and go somewhere else or stop doing this or to take a class so they can earn more money. It's the after-tax incentive that is critical to human behavior. Now, when you look at taxes, taxes have an unusual impact on that after-tax incentive. For example, if there were no taxes and a guy earned 100 bucks a day, that guy's incentive for working would be $100. Now, if you put that tax on that, let's say 1% tax, that guy's incentive now would be $99. So if you introduce a 1% income tax, you got a $99 incentive. You with me? Now, if you make that tax 99%, that person's incentives now are dropped down from $100 to $1. So with a 99% tax, the incentive effect now is 1%. They're not proportional. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of the Kennedy administration in the 1960s. That's it. When John F. Kennedy put through his tax bill, what he did was he dropped the highest marginal income tax rate from 91% to 70%. Y you follow me? He dropped the lowest tax bracket from 20% to 14%. Okay, that's what he did the highest. And all the ones in the middle he did, it did as well. Okay? But I want to do these two top ones. Now, when you look at the top one, he dropped the highest rate from 91% to 70%. That's a 21 percentage point reduction in the highest tax rate. You follow? All right. 21 percentage point reduction divided by 91. That's a 23% cut in the highest marginal income tax rate. With me? Now, at the lowest rate, where he dropped the 20% to 14, that's a 6 percentage point drop in the tax rate. Six percentage point from 20%, that's a 30% drop in the income tax rate at the lowest bracket. All right? A 23% cut in the top bracket and a 30% cut in the bottom bracket. If you looked at it that way, uh, you'd miss the whole point of incentives. Take a look at the incentives in the very top bracket. Before Kennedy's tax cut, he made a buck, all right? He paid 91 cents in taxes, and he was allowed to keep nine cents. His incentive for working in the highest tax bracket before the tax cut was nine cents on the dollar. After the tax cut, it went from 91% down to 70%. That person's incentives now are 30 cents on the dollar. He earns a dollar, he pays 70 cents in taxes, he gets to keep 30 cents. That's his incentive for working at the highest bracket. His incentive has gone from nine cents to 30 cents. That is a 233% increase in incentives for a 23% cut in the tax rate. Okay, when you look at the Laffer curve effects here, okay, all that, what you have is the arithmetic effect is the 23%. The economic effect is based on the 233% increase in incentives. Now let's go to the lowest bracket where the guy drive had the tax rate drop from 20% to 14%. That's a 30% cut in the tax rates. Now look at that person's incentives to work. Before the tax cut, if that person earned a buck, he paid 20 cents in taxes, and his incentive for working there was 80 cents on the dollar. With me? After the tax cuts, he now only pays 14 cents in the dollar. So now his incentive after the tax cut is 87 cents. Going from 80 to 87 cents, uh, excuse me, 80 to, excuse me, I, I missed 80 to, 80 to 86 cents, excuse me, 80 to 86 cents incentives. That's a 7.5% increase in incentives, and that's a 30% cut in tax rates. The static, the arithmetic effect there is designed by the 30% cut in the rate, and the economic effect is done by the 7.5% increase in incentives. If you look at the cut in the top tax rate, and you can understand now why supply-side economists all want a flat tax, and if they're going to cut taxes, they want to cut the highest tax, is because the static revenue loss in the highest bracket being 20, 23% and the incentive effect there, that is a benefit cost ratio of 10 to 1 when you cut the highest rate. But in the lowest rate when you do it, the benefit cost ratio is 1 to 4. That's why you get a very, very different incentive effect when you cut tax rates and they're disproportional, they're in the opposite direction, but they're not proportional with the tax rates. The higher tax rates are, 
the greater will be the incentive effect for any given tax cut. The lower tax rates are, the less will be the incentive effect from any tax rate cut. Are we all together? It's really important you see the incentive, because it's incentives that drives this model. It's incentives that drives this world. Now, in our book, Taxes Have Consequences, uh, we start off, we are, we want to address taxes not in some sort of weird, uh, academic, uh, unrelated fashion. We want to direct this study, and we have directed this study, directly to the political economy. We want to look at taxes in the context of the politics of the times and what happened during those times. Now, uh, one of the, mo the most important groups today, and you've noted, with, it's the group, uh, Jennifer, that want to raise the highest tax rates. Uh, what is her name? Elizabeth Warren. You ever heard of her? And, and then there's uh, Bernie, Bernie uh, Sanders. Uh, there's uh, AOC. There's the whole squad. I could go, and it's not just those people. There are a lot of people who want to keep those tax rates high, if not raise them. I mean, it has been a huge issue in the U.S. as to how we redistribute income from the rich to the lower income groups in the system. And I want to talk about that group right now in the context of economics, period. Uh, it's, it, it's leading intellectual is probably a guy named Thomas Piketty from France. Uh, his book is called Capital. Uh, it's followed by Emmanuel Saez of uh, Berkeley, uh, Zuckman, uh, Gabriel Zuckman, I think, of Harvard, and Sancheva. There are a group of these economists. All of them have advised uh, the uh, Warrens and, and the Bernie Sanders on how they can raise tax rates, and they've made a lot of claims. And I want to go through what they say first, and then I'm going to go through the book and how we respond to that. <clears throat> what they start off with is they use the tax return data, and I've got to, I've got to hand it to them. They're, they're, they're extraordinarily adept at handling the tax codes of the U.S. They, they really are very, very knowledgeable. We, if you look at the tax codes, when I told you in the first one it was formed in 1913, it was 7% was the highest rate. There were only 389,000 people who filed. If you look at the top 1%, that's only 3,890 people in the top 1%, I mean, and 62 million total adults at that time. It was a very small group. What they have done is they have recreated all of the tax data going back to 1913 and put it in terms of modern day taxes, assuming it had been completed for the whole adult population. Now, honestly, we didn't get to being fully, an income tax in the United States didn't become fully effective until about 1943. That's when we've got our modern income tax, which then applied to virtually everyone in the adult population. But what they did is they wanted to look at income distribution. They wanted to look at how tax codes could improve that. And let me, if I can, just put up here, can I do that first chart one? If I can. What they looked at was they looked at the share of income reported and earned by the top 1% of income earners, okay? This is the share of income. So if you look over here, uh, the share of income in 1913 was about 18%. The top 1% earned about 18% of all the income. And then you can see it goes from there, it goes up a little bit to 19%, and then it drops down to about 15%, you see that? Then it skyrockets way up there to about 24%, you see that? And then it has this U-shaped curve dropping down, there, sort of this downward sloping U-shaped curve. And then it starts about 1978, 1983, all of a sudden, the income distribution starts getting less and less equal, and the rich, the top 1%, start earning more and more, the larger and larger share of total income. This is the basis of all of their work on income distribution. Now, the reason this is the basis is this is what they say is income distribution. This is income inequality. As you go down, of course, as the curve falls down, income distribution is more equal. As it goes up, it's less equal. Now, here's the magical sauce. If I could do the second chart, please. They then put on top of this income inequality chart the highest marginal income tax rate applicable to the top income earners in the U.S. You follow that? This is the highest tax rate. Now, in 1913, 
The highest marginal income tax rate was 7%. It was 7% for 13, 14, and 15. Then because of the onslaught of World War I, that tax rate went all the way up. By 1918, that highest income tax rate had hit 77%. Not only did it hit 77%, but they expanded the tax code to cover a lot more people. They covered it so it covered six and a half million people now. There was a 17-fold increase in the coverage of the income tax, and the tax rate was raised from 7% to 77%. Now, all of a sudden, you can see that tax rate coming down. This is the Roaring Twenties. Uh, you got Harding and Coolidge in there on the Roaring Twenties. You can see that. Harding and Coolidge dropped the rate from 77% down to 73% for three years. Then it dropped further. Finally, it got down to about 25% at the end of the 30s, all right? And you can see income inequality, as they measure it, going way, way up, all right? Then you get the, night, uh, the Great Depression. The highest income tax rate in 1932 was raised from 25% uh, to 63%. I mean, a huge increase. All these other taxes were raised as well. And then throughout the Great Depression and World War II, they raised the rate from 63% all the way on up to 94% in 1945. All right, that's the history there. You can see during that whole period of very high tax rates, income inequality disappears. Income is much more equitably distributed, they argue. And then, of course, you get a little blip down there of Harry Truman cutting it back down to 82%, and there's a little blip increase in income inequality. Then it goes on at these very high rates. It stays at 91% throughout the whole Eisenhower administration. There, then you get the Kennedy tax cuts. You can see the Kennedy tax cuts there, where he drops it from 91% to 70%. And then all of a sudden, you get the little blip up for Kennedy. Income inequality got worse. And then you see, going along here, all of a sudden, you get to the 1978 to 83 period. All of a sudden, we get a new era in America. Ronald Reagan gets in. We get the capital gains tax cut in 1978. We get Proposition 13. We get Paul Volcker coming in. The Reagan era begins, and those tax rates are brought way down, and lo and behold, income inequality increases dramatically again. Now you've got the scream and cries on the streets of income inequality is directly related to taxes on the highest income earners, and we must, as a just society, we must raise taxes to get income uh, inequality out of the way, get people far more equal. Do you understand the appeal? The thing, I wanted to make sure you see this because this is exactly the lecture that Saez gives. Now let me take you through, if I can, through the next couple of charts here because this is what we go through in the first three chapters of the book. First thing you want to see here is I want to take you through that tax rate again, but this time I want to go through the economic history of what happens to the U.S. economy during this period. If you look back at the very beginning when Wilson is president, and the income tax is put in at 7%, even though it's applicable to only a small group of people. That period, going from there till 1918, the beginning of the war, when they raised the rate to 77%, was a horrible period in the U.S. economy. Raising that tax rate is associated right there with an extraordinarily bad economy in the U.S. Then you have, after 1918, you had the political kerfluffle of all political kerfluffles. Uh, you had... Uh, <clears throat> you had Wilson lowering the tax rate from 77% uh, down to 73%. Hey, remember it's incentives. They went from 23 cents in the dollar now to 70 to 27 cents in the dollar. That's the incentive effect. All right, that was it. We came to 1920. All right, 1920 was the big battle politically in the U.S. Uh, between, <clears throat> between the sort of the Wilson branch of the Democratic Party uh, the Democratic candidate at that time was handpicked by Woodrow Wilson. Uh, it was Governor Cox of Ohio was the Democratic candidate selected. Uh, he chose his best friend and good friend and great ally, the uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, a guy named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the battle in 1920, the election battle was, should we keep the tax rates high and pay off the wartime debt, so the argument went, or should we lower tax rates and get the economy growing and going again. You had Cox and, Cox and Roosevelt versus Harding and Coolidge. Harding and Coolidge ran to cut tax rates down and get the growth back in the country. A return to normalcy was their slogan. Uh, Harding and Coolidge won the election. And I, I want to make sure you see these in current context because the politics of the U.S. has never changed. Harding and Coolidge won the election by the largest percentage 
ever in U.S. history. They took the office, and of course they took the office in 1921. Uh, at that time, the, they lowered the tax rates. Now, if you know they're going to cut tax rates next year, what do you do this year? You do all you can to postpone your income so you can take advantage of the lower taxes. The same thing worked with Kennedy, the same thing worked with Reagan, and the same thing worked with Harding and Coolidge. So you, got, you can see there, as the tax rates came way down and they come, you have a very bad economy. You have the post-World War I depression recession because of the delay in the tax cuts. And then you get this incredible boom. It was called the Roaring Twenties. The U.S. economy boomed like never before until we get to 1929. I mean, you've got a really good economy with the low tax rates. It just is booming. 1929, we have something called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff put in. It is the largest tax on traded products in U.S. history. It was passed by the House and the Senate in 1929, late in 1929, but everyone knew that Hoover loved it. Everyone knew that Hoover loved it. Uh, and you can see that the stock market crashes from its peak in September to December. It fell in that three-month period by 35%. When we look at our whole drop recently is about 30, 35% um, under this president. I mean, and then we start 1930. Uh, in 1930, in June of 1930, uh, Hoover decides that he's going to sign the bill. He signs the bill. You know, you can't believe the precipitation of the Great Depression that came about from this horrendous tax increase. The stock market fell by 95% from peak to trough. The average stock, which went for a dollar at the peak, was now selling for five cents. The average. Some were a little higher. A lot were a lot lower than that. The economy, the unemployment rate skyrocketed up. And what did Hoover do? Hoover, in his infinite wisdom, uh, saw that revenues were coming in short. Now, remember, in those days, the taxes were not collected as you earned them. All right? They were not a cruel basis. They were paid the year later in April. So whatever you earned in one year, you didn't pay any taxes until the next April. So they didn't realize their revenue shortfall. Uh, they had a huge shortfall on January 1st, 1932. Herbert Hoover passed a tax increase. It was really, really a little later than that. They made it retroactive. They passed the ta highest tax rate went from 25% to, uh, to 63%. Is that a good enough increase for you? They raised all sorts of others. They put in the death tax. They put in the gift tax. They had corporate tax increases. I mean, there wasn't a tax they didn't see that they didn't want to raise, whether it flew, swam, whatever it did. They raised that tax. Uh, needless to say, the economy spiraled down to the Great Depression. Unemployment rates 18, 19, 20 percent, even higher at some times there. Uh, then we had the election. Roosevelt won the election in a landslide when he took office in 1933, in March of 1933. He did not raise the tax rates again, but he did something else. He put in the first U.S. wealth tax. In the, we had something called the Bank Holiday Act of 1933, which is done in March of 1933, where he, I thought the Bank Holiday Act was just a basically, he got a group of bankers together, they took a, a cruise down to the Bermudas and had a little fun, but no, that's not what happened. The Bank Holiday Act what, had, four, had four provisions. Number one, gold clauses in contracts, private or public, are voided, but the contract is still totally enforceable. Number two, Banks are no longer able to, allowed to buy or sell specie. Now, remember back then it was gold, coin, gold coins, silver coins. We were on a gold standard, literally. So you could not take your checking account into the bank any longer and ask for gold to come back. That was illegal. Uh, you had to only get the paper back. That was, that was what you were allowed to do. The other thing they did was they also made it illegal for banks to buy or sell foreign exchange, period. And the last thing they did, which is the, the crux of the matter, they required all Americans to turn in their gold into the treasury. All Americans do criminal penalties for not doing it. Now, they gave you a little exception. I think each person was allowed to keep 100 bucks worth of gold. Dentists were allowed to keep a little bit more, you know, whatever they, a little bit more. But all Americans were, they took all that gold and all that specie, put it down in Fort Knox. Have any of you ever been to Fort Knox? Well, I've seen a couple of people who told me they were there, and I asked them, did you see the gold? No, no. I don't really know if it's there or not, but let's assume it is. They took all the gold out of the circulation for six months. They took it and they compensated all the people for the gold at $20.67 an ounce for the gold. That's what they paid them. Six months later, they revalued gold. 
from $20.67 an ounce to $35 an ounce. They devalued the U.S. dollar against all foreign currencies by 60%. What they did was they basically confiscated all the gold from the U.S. and gave them very little compensation in return. It was the first major wealth tax. It was a very large tax, and of course the economy just continues its desperate spiral downward. Uh, 1937, they raised the highest marginal income tax rate again. You can see it up here at the 79%. You can see it at the 79%. <clears throat> then they all went through all the war until they got to the end of the war. You can see at the end of the war right there in 1945, it was 94%. I mean, think of it, 94%. Every dollar you earned, you were allowed to keep six cents. I mean, that had to pass the Congress, the House, and the Senate, and be signed into law by the President. I mean, can you imagine the debate back then between uh, liberals and conservatives? I mean, imagine a liber conservative finds says, hey, hey, stop right there. I'm willing to go along with 94%. I am. But 98%, that's gouging. And the, and the liberal returns, yeah, 90%, that's a giveaway to fat cat Richies. You know, that was the discussion. Then after World War II, we had Harry Truman there. Uh, they tried to cut taxes right after the war. Uh, he vetoed two major tax cuts. There he'd, they passed the third tax cut. He vetoed it too, but the Congress passed it over his veto. And you can see the slight drop there, right about 1948, 49, 50. You see the taxes. They went from 94% down to 82%. And that's a huge increase in incentives, by the way. You went from six cents in the dollar to 18 cents in the dollar. That's a trebling of incentives in that period. And that's why you got that post-war boom. And then, of course, on came the Korean War. And even before Eisenhower took office, they would popped that highest marginal income tax rate back up to 91%. You, you see that? They had the little blip for one year that it went up a little bit more than that, 92%. And then we had the 91% all the way out to the Kennedy period. You then see Kennedy cut the highest income tax rate. During this period of the Eisenhower years, we had three recessions. It was a desperately bad economy. I mean, it really was. All of these periods were horrible for consumers, for the poor, the, all the people in the country. They then we had the Kennedy go-go 60s. We dropped the highest rate from 91% to 70, as I mentioned earlier, the lowest from 20 to 14. He did a lot of other tax cuts, the Kennedy round tariff negotiation. And you can see it was called the go-go 60s. And we had this boomlet during Kennedy's short term in office. Then we had the period of the Four Stooges. Um, I like to refer to them as Four Stooges, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, which is the largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance probably ever put on, on planet Earth. And of course, you can see all the doldrums during that period there. And then you get to the end of the Carter period. And oh, excuse me, does anyone, is there water? Just joking. My heart just goes, the skies cleared, the sun shore forth in the earth, uh, the fields turned green, the animals, they multiplied, the trees blossomed and bore fruit, and children danced, and Ronnie Reagan took office. And you can now see this period here of Reagan there going on, of the very low tax rates. The whole history of the U.S. is directly tied to taxes, and the highest marginal income tax rate. Let me just say what Saez and Piketty do not say. Every time you raise those taxes, the economy went into the doldrums. Every single time. Here it is. You can follow it. When they cut those taxes, the economy was in freed and prosperity returned. And then they raised them again. You had the Great Depression. You then had World War II. World War II, after tax incomes, consumable incomes for people, were worse than they had been a century earlier. It's crazy how bad things were. And then you get the post-World War II, the little boomlet there, uh, all right, of the tax cut, the overriding of, of Truman's veto. You had a little boomlet there. Then you got the horrible period of Eisenhower. Then you got the boom of the go-go 60s, where there really was prosperity. Then you got the Four Stooges, which was, and now you can see the whole post-Reagan prosperity that we've had here. What I'm telling you is every time they raised tax rates, the economy went into the doldrums. Every time they lowered tax rates, the economy prospered. This is not mentioned in their work at all, but it fits like a glove on a hand. It is the first immutable fact of raising taxes clearly leads to less prosperity. Lowering them leads to more prosperity, period. Let me now go to the next one. Now, remember, I'm talking about after-tax incentives here the whole time with you. Here we're talking about the income of the rich, the top 1% of income earners. You with me? Top 1%. This is the income they report. 
All right, I'm talking about incentive effects here, so I don't have it plotted against the highest tax rate. I have it plotted against one minus the highest tax rate. It's like the spider of a push on a mirror. This is the incentive effects resulting from taxes. So when this number is low, when the red number is low, that means tax rates are high and there's very low incentive. When that number is high, it means incentives are high and tax rates are very low. Look at this relationship if you would look at it. There's a direct relationship here. When you raise tax rates on the rich, the rich report less income. That's just duh. Now, there are two reasons why they report less income. Number one, they do earn less income. That's true. They do. But what they do earn, they now use tax shelters. And those tax shelters develop instantaneously. You all know this, but these guys, professors, don't have a clue what's going on here. And you can see the relationship here. Whenever they raise tax rates on the rich, all right, the rich report, earn less income and report less income because they shelter what they do report. Okay? And when you lower tax rates, the rich earn more income and they also stop sheltering their income, so they report it more. The lower the tax rate, the more of their honest income they report. The higher the tax rate, the less they report and the less they earn. That's the number one. High tax rates hurt the rich and also cause the rich to shelter their income. And low tax rates help the rich and they also cause the rich to report more income, unshelter their income. All right, let me go to the next one if I can. And this is the one I love more than life itself. This is total tax revenue collected from the top 1% of income earners and the incentive rate. Now remember, when tax rates are high, the incentive rate is low. When tax rates are low, the incentive rate is high. Look at this. When the incentive rate is high, tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners are extraordinarily high, okay, collected from the top 1%. When you raise tax rates in the rich, those incentives go down and the revenue from the top 1% of income earners drops like a stone. Every single year, if you watch that, what happens is whenever we've raised tax rates in the rich, the rich pay less in taxes. Whenever we've lowered tax rates in the rich, the rich pay more in taxes. Look at this revenue rise here uh, in, the, in the recent period since Reagan. Look at that revenue rise, okay? Now this is exactly, number one, when you raise tax rates, the economy goes to hell. When you lower tax rates, it does really well. Number two, two when you raise tax rates in the rich, rich earn less, but they shelter more and they earn, report less income. When you lower tax rates, the rich shelter less and earn more and they report a lot more income. When you raise tax rates on the rich, the rich pay less in taxes, and when you lower tax rates in the rich, they pay more in taxes. Year in, year out, these are the IRS numbers correctly reported. I mean, this is the, they don't mention this in their books or in their works at all, the, the, the Warren and, and, and Sanders people at all. Let me go to the last one with you, which is just to show the effect here uh, of the last one. And this one is really sort of neat. Uh, this bottom line, this red bottom line, is total taxes collected from the top 1% of income earners, total taxes collected, divided by GNP, gross national product. So you take total taxes divided by gross national product, and you get that red line there. What is it uh, there? It's about 1%, one, 1.5% one in the beginning. You can see it rises up to about 2% in the middle. You see there the tax rates? And then you can see it going right up starting in 1983, the Reagan tax cuts, boom. You can see it going way up to where it's above 3% for most of the recent period. So that rate trebles, that percentage trebles. Now, what I've got in the green line there is total tax revenues collected from the bottom 95%. This is the lower income groups there. If you look at this during periods of very high tax rates, tax revenues from the lower income groups rise as a share of GDP dramatically during this period. They go way, way up. I mean, way more than taxes from the top 1%. You can see that goes way up there until Reagan cuts taxes. And then all of a sudden, magically, while the tax revenues from the top 1% go up as a share of GDP, what you can see happening here is tax revenues from the bottom 95% 
start declining dramatically. What you can say here is when you raise taxes, they earn more and they report. When you raise taxes, they earn less and report less. When you lower taxes, they earn more and report more. Number two, when you raise tax rates, the rich pay less in taxes. When you lower tax rates, the rich pay more in taxes. When you raise tax rates, the economy goes in the doldrums. When you lower tax rates, it booms. And lastly, when you raise tax rates in the rich, the burden of taxation on the poor increases dramatically. And when you lower tax rates on the rich, the burden of taxation on the poor goes down. This is the first, these are the first three chapters of the books. You'll love it. Uh, we go through World War II in great detail. I, I'm just giving you the quick summary here. I'm giving you the political summary. This will be the cry and the song of the Republican Party and maybe a lot of Democrats, I would hope, at least one Democrat whom I know who's the governor of this state, I'm sure will go along with this line. But it will be the political battleground for going forward. Uh, you'll love the Great Depression chapter. They, taxes caused the Great Depression. You'll love the, uh, you'll love the uh, World War II chapter as well. It explains why World War II d happened the way it did, all the results there. I'm going to stop here, but I just want to say it's really fun being with all of you. I'm going to now introduce my colleague and co-author. Uh, I'm not going to introduce that bear that was up in the upper meadow there. But um, I do have one other co-author. I want to just mention her name, Jean Sinkfield, who is a co-author of the book as well. Brian, you're on. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Laffer. Thank you, Jennifer, and to the Steamboat Institute uh, for having us. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to be in Beaver Creek. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. First, my name is Brian Dimitrovic, and I'm a historian. I've been with the Laffer Center full-time for three years. I was a professor for many years at Sam Houston State University in Texas. Uh, I'm an intellectual historian. I, I got my PhD at Harvard in the 1990s, uh, studying the history of thought in the 20th century, the great intellectual dynamics uh, of this country with a, with a specialty uh, in the economics department. Uh, my professors were Jeffrey Williamson, who's cited in Arthur Laffer's dissertation of 1972, and David Landis. You might remember his books on the wealth and poverty of nations and the unbound Prometheus from years ago. Um, and I, uh, I first decided to write about uh, supply-side economics and Arthur Laffer uh, in the early 2000s, actually, after I, I had already written on other subjects in the kind of grand conversation of intellectual life. And I, uh, I came to write about the history of supply-side economics, first on listening to a, a former colleague of uh, Dr. Laffer's, Robert Mundell. Uh, I saw his Nobel Prize lecture online uh, from 1999, which he called a reconsideration of the 20th century, in which he introduced kind of the rise of, kind of classical supply-side economics as the linchpin that can make you understand the 20th century, if you understand when we had sound gold-backed money, gold-defined money, and low tax rates, you can see the wonderful prosperity of the 20th century. And when you see deviations from that trend towards unclassical money and tax increases, well, then you see the other oscillations of the 20th century, and they got pretty bad globally. He specifically mentioned the Great Depression, World War II, and the Holocaust, did Robert Mundell in that 1999 Nobel Prize lecture. It was after that lecture that I I decided that the supply-side revolution of the 1970s and 1980s was far too consequential a talk uh, to leave um, to posterity untouched. And it, it does remain true, rather oddly, that I perhaps am the only historian of supply-side economics that has ever existed. Um, the history that I write about in the book outside, The Emergence of Arthur Laffer, The Foundations of Supply-Side Economics, 1966, to 1976 uh, largely belongs to more than half a century ago. Um, there are 20,000 members of the American Historical Association. This is not even to talk about economics who practice, economists who practice history. And yet there is an odd tendency among scholarly historians, academic historians, even popular historians, not to write about the great tradition that gave us the Reagan revolution in economics. And I, I think I know why. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in the academy, including at the pinnacle of the Ivy League. And I think I know that they'll have to tell the story 
as having a happy ending. It, it ended with the great Reagan boom of the 1980s and 1990s, and I, I don't think you know, Keynesian and even Marxist economics want to tell a story of the Industrial Revolution and capitalism that has a happy ending. Well, no, it's supposed to have a revolutionary ending uh, towards socialism and so forth. No, no, it all worked out. Capitalism's fine. Uh, so I think, they, therefore, they just stay away from it. I also think the other reason that his professional historians stay away from the supply side revolution is because it is indisputably intellectually profound. Uh, it's very difficult to end up calling these people cranks and not knowing what they're talking about when they're actually on the extreme cutting edge of intellectual economics. So uh, I'd like to review uh, the other book that we're talking about here tonight, and that's the book that I wrote and published last year, just recently in paperback, both hard and paperback are available outside, and that is The Emergence of Arthur Laffer, The Foundations of Supply Side Economics in Chicago and Washington, 1966 to 1976. Again, that book is published right now. Taxes Have Consequences, Arthur Laffer, Brian Dimitrovic, and Gene Sinkfield will be out in September, and that's an income tax history of the United States. Uh, supply side economics did not come from tax policy. Tax policy and tax economics was not Arthur Laffer's first love. Uh, he was a phenom in academic economics uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, he was a business student at Stanford University, having graduated with his BA from Yale in 1963. And it was at that time that he became tremendously interested in economics. He ended up as a business student, as an MBA student, first year, 1963 at Stanford, 23 years of age, uh, kind of going over to the economics department and taking their profound classes. And the first professor he had was indeed a Marxist, a fellow named Paul Buran. He's a very interesting man uh, who kept going on about how capitalism can be very productive, but it produces so much waste. And that idea stuck with him, and he says, yes, Arthur Laffer ended up saying, yes, that surplus that is wasted is what government spending is. And <laughs> capitalism produces so much wealth, and this big waste is taken by the government. It's actually kind of a profound idea. And so he kind of, we often hear about kind of the Marxists kind of getting a hold of capitalism. Well, here's someone who got a hold of Marxism. He stole one of their ideas and told us about what government spending is. At any rate, Arthur Laffer uh, got his MBA at Stanford in uh, the spring of 1965, but he had taken so many economics courses. Uh, that he wanted to, be, to, uh, to take his PhD. Um, and he got an offer from Morgan Stanley at that point, uh, which you know, would have been kind of career defining, and he, he decided not to take it. He, he, he shook that off, and he said, I, I want to become an academic economist. And he very quickly uh, ended up getting a tenure track job at a number of places, and he picked the one at Chicago in the spring of 1967. And uh, let me tell you, uh, the University of Chicago economics faculties and the, the mid-late 1960s, that was probably the acme of the practice of economics in modern history across the globe. I mean, it's very difficult to identify an economics department at any point in time in modern history as consequential and as profound as was Chicago's at that time. This was the economics department, yes, of Milton Friedman, that household name, of a roster of future Nobel Prize winners. The Nobel Prize in economics would be started in 1969. Theodore Schultz, George Stigler, Gary Becker, uh, Gene Fama, the list goes on. It was that economics department that offered this young student who just basically passed his comprehensive exams and was starting to write his dissertation and said, we want to offer you a tenure track appointment at the University of Chicago. And so he went. Now, what was the economics that this young kid was writing about? Uh, it was not the economics of taxation, and that's a I think an important point, taxation came at mid-course to the supply side revolution, really not until the mid-1970s. You know, take a wild guess, what was the economic interest of this young phenom? It was actually the number one macroeconomic issue of the time, not only in academic precincts itself, themselves, but also in political discussion. And that was, should we or should we not have a gold standard? That was the preeminent macroeconomic debate of the late 1960s. As you may remember or may know, the United States in the 1960s still was venerably on the gold standard. It guaranteed the dollar to foreign authorities, not domestic ones. It was illegal from 1933 to 1974 for individual Americans to own gold, if that can be believed. Uh, it's authoritarian from FDR. Uh, but foreign monetary authorities could buy uh, gold and sell it to the United States freely. 
And so the United States had to guarantee the dollar at $35 an ounce. And uh, with the dollar guaranteed at $35 an ounce, you'll notice that a lot of people wanted to invest with it. That economic boom after the JFK tax cut in the 1960s was for real. This is the post-war American economy in the 1960s growing at 5% per year for nine straight years. Um, that means investors the world over really like the dollar guaranteed in dole, gold because they got to get their profits in that dollar. And here's the biggest economy in the world growing at 5%. Big debate at that time, big debate. Should we have a dollar that is defined in gold and therefore have fixed exchange rates across the major currencies? Well, the increasing chorus of economists and to a degree policymakers, not business people so much, was that we should have floating exchange rates and a dollar delinked from gold, gold relegated to a non-monetary, unofficial role, if any. And Arthur Laffer and some others, a few others, his advisor, Emile Dupre, Robert Mundell, to a significant degree, Ronald McKinnon, his professor at Stanford, all said, no, we should have fixed exchange rates and a gold dollar. And his articles on these topics were profound. I mean, you can read the pretty technical discussions in my book. For example, his classic paper in 1968, which really upended the field a decade later in the 70s called an anti-traditional theory of, uh, uh, of fixed exchange rates. Um, it was just a working paper, it was never published, and people rediscovered it in the mid-1970s and said, when there was the middle of stagflation, said, remember what he warned us about if we went off gold? You know, he said this in 1968, and it was rediscovered in 1975, and people at Brookings Institution had a big conference on it, let's read about it, find out about it. Yeah, the, the economics of, of this young economist on the tenure track at Chicago was, let me spell out to you the economics of a gold dollar. When the dollar's backed in gold, investors the world over love it. People want to use it. They want to trade with it. It's they love it. And if you go flexible, if you go non-gold, they're going to look for something else. Boy, was that proven right in the 1970s. And I'm going to have something to say about this at the end because it seems like we might be reprising this history a little bit now because guess what we're re-entering into 2022, stagflation. And the book out there is about kind of the intellectual history of people trying to hold back the cage of stagflation that finally was unlocked with the dropping of gold in 1971. Well, Arthur Laffer got tenure at a tender age of 29 at the University of Chicago in 1969, you know, young phenom. And uh, thereupon, the United States quickly went off the gold standard <laughs> and opted for flexible exchange rates. And this was while uh, Dr. Laffer was in the White House. He was working for in the Richard Nixon White House under George Shultz, his mentor at the University of Chicago Business School. But nonetheless, the decisions were made. And the 1970s, do we have to revisit it, beginning very quickly in 1971, uh, was just a cascade of economic mistakes and unpleasant experiences. Inflation, which had basically been nil, maybe 1%, through the mid-1960s, quickly soared up to 6% by the end of the decade, and then was regularly in the double digits in the 1970s. The tax code was on index for inflation, so if you got a 10% raise to match the 10% inflation of 1974, 1975, the double-digit inflation of 1979, 1980, 1981, if you got a double-digit raise to just to match the inflation, you faced a marginal tax structure that, that taxed you at the highest rate you were subject to. So you had to get a super raise often 150% above the rate of inflation, sometimes four times the rate of inflation if you were earning high money, just to keep pace with inflation. So the tax system started eating the American economy alive because of the inflation, and that's where he came in with taxation. He started studying it, probably in the Nixon White House under the Social Security tax, he was looking at that intensively and then said, yeah, the tax system is really getting involved with this non-classical, non-gold monetary system, and you're seeing this inflation push people into higher tax brackets, and it's leading to lower and lower economic activity because the more you work, the less and less and less you're gonna get after tax, that return rate. And so that's what got, started him drawing equations, saying this is the Laffer curve. One of the discoveries in the book, and I found this in uh, Arthur Laffer's basement office, um, is that I did find that he, he drew the Laffer curve before the napkin, and he, he had worked it out in equations probably in 1973, a year before the napkin. And uh, I have a picture of his, uh, his probably original, one of his first drawings, the Laffer curve, that's derived from an equation. Okay, I want to have a few comments, and we're going to have plenty of time here for questions. 
about uh, what I have taken from, from this research. I do want to point out one little clever thing, though. I think I've identified the day that Arthur Laffer drew that, nap, that curve on a napkin uh, before Jude Winiski and Dick Cheney and maybe some others. And I think that date was December 6, 1974. A lot of contextual cues, quite a few indicate that date. And I found, figured out something else about that date, December 6, 1974, when I do believe that Laffer curve was first drawn on a napkin to those officials and that important journalist, editorial writer of the Wall Street Journal. Um, that was the lowest point of the Dow Jones Industrial Average in the 60 years between October 1962 and today. The single lowest close was that afternoon at 4 o'clock. Um, so in other words, the drawing of the Laffer curve uh, called the bottom, the long-term nominal, nominal bottom of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I can't imagine that was coincidental. Um, information theory says that uh, stocks incorporate a new information immediately, and somehow I believe that information got out over the weekend, and the market opened higher that Monday and never saw a lower rate, a lower close. And that close hadn't been seen since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. So that's a powerful correlation. I mean, how many, that's 60 years of closes. And the lowest one in those 60 years was two hours before he drew the Laffer curve in a napkin. Uh, if I took anything away from the book as of uh, June 2022, it's that, oh boy, we're starting to reprise stagflation again. And what these, uh, what these economists, Arthur Laffer and his colleagues, um, pointed out as they were scrambling to defend the gold standard in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and they failed in doing so admittedly, and then they had a heck of a revenge, and they came back and just said, okay, well, then we'll cut tax rates. And uh, they carried that right to Ronald Reagan, and he did it. It's an incredible story of academic revenge through policy. Um, those guys, Mundell and Laffer, told us in the late 60s and early 70s, if you have a monetary system that's really delivering prosperity, don't get rid of it. And if you get rid of it, and then you have real problems, it's because you got rid of that monetary system. So my sense today is what the economy is clamoring for is a classical monetary system. That's what the economy wants. Probably means return to some kind of gold standard. If that's a crank idea, not allowed in polite company, it's too bad. I think that's what the economy wants. And if we want our American dream back in the 21st century, we're probably going to have to get serious about it. And a pretty detailed discussion of that debate back in the 1960s and 1970s is in that book. So thank you very much. OK, now we're going to um, ask some of the audience questions. And if you have a question, it's not too late to submit it using the QR code. So please go ahead and submit your questions. OK, we have two of these. I'm going to combine because they're very similar. The recent explosion of the Fed balance sheet, the monetary base, and M2 is suspected of having caused most of the current inflation, which is at about 8.6 percent. Would Milton Friedman be turning over in his grave? <laughs> Practically, what advice would you give the Fed or Treasury Secretary to influence the Fed balance sheet and interest rates, and what do you think we should expect from the Fed interest rates, and inflation over the next three to six months? Ryan or me? I think you're going to take it. Is that, actually, I'll, mm -hmm. yeah. I'll take it. You know, it's already well in play. I don't know that there's anything this Fed can do or will do or has any inclination to do. We have a Fed balance sheet of $9 trillion. Now, the question I would ask you today, if the Fed decided to reduce its balance sheet by selling off some of the bonds, if it did, how much would you pay, uh, how much would you require the Fed interest rate on a 10-year bond to be for you to actively want to put your money in and buy it? 15, there, it's way up there. You know, what we have right now, the 10-year bond is maybe 340, 3.4%. Uh, uh, if they were to do any real major removal of assets off their balance sheet, or if they would stop buying the Treasury debt, either one of those, you will see rises in interest rates not comprehended by this group, not contemplated by this group at all. You'd see interest rates in the range of 15, 16, 17 percent, with inflation running at 10 percent, and you would see a crash there. I don't know how we can stop that from happening today. The whole thing has been left. We have a monetary-based system 
that will not in any way, shape, or form constrain the growth in inflation. I don't think it's causing it, but it won't constrain it either. They'd have to shrink that base. The monetary base, I think in uh, 19, uh, 2000, uh, 2008 was about $730 billion. Today it's, uh, what, it's seven trillion? I mean, there is absolutely nothing they can do with the monetary. I think we're in for a long run. I don't think there's any way power any of these people who are inexperienced and incompetent, nice people, but they are selected for characteristics other than competence in monetary policy. And uh, they don't know what, there's not a Volcker out there, there's not an Alan Green out, Spain out there, there's not a McChesney Martin, there's not, an, there's not an Arthur Burns out there. So I really am very pessimistic about the near term. I don't see how we can even slow inflation down. If you look at the inflation numbers and look at the monthly numbers, the recent monthly numbers are way above the average inflation. The early monthly numbers are below the rate of inflation, which is a classic sign of an ever-increasing rate of inflation. Uh, there's no sign that the producer price index is well above the consumer price index, which is the period of... I'm on the, I'm on the board of uh, a couple of REITs, and the rents are one-third of the overall index. Those rents are going like this, the renewals. And then you get new rents or even higher growth than that. I mean. We are in the midst of, a, of an inflation spiral that I don't see how or what way it brings about a solution that will stop inflation. Um, in, in the emergence book, Dr. Laffer, you advocated that the monetary system would be more stable with a gold standard. Do you still feel we would be better off on the gold standard? And if so, why? It, the, the, I mean, the concept of a paper currency without any backing whatsoever uh, run by a bunch of people who are accepted, uh, who are appointed because of their gender or because of their age or because, whatever it is, is not a sound system at all. If you want money, you want to be able to know what the value is today, what it's going to be 10 years from now, what's going to be 30 years from now. That's what contracts need. They don't need political correctness and wokeness. They, they really don't. They need just competence. And this administration has literally zero competence on the monetary policy. You can see what they're doing on Treasury. I mean, in the president's budget sent to Congress, it still has Build Back Better of an additional $6 trillion in spending. They, you don't think they've spent enough? I mean, this is what's really triggered the beginning, and I don't see anything there. Uh, I would suggest that after 24, uh, and I'm going to be writing up something like the 20 policy prescriptions that I want the Republican administration and Congress to have, of those, I think one of them would be removed, going back to a monetary standard uh, and perhaps the gold-based monetary standard, not where you have huge amounts of gold in your vaults or anything like that. Uh, it's where you just gear your monetary policy to the price of gold and make sure you keep it in line with that. Uh, I wrote something for Reagan in 1981 called Reinstatement of the Dollar, the Blueprint, which I looked at price primals and quantity duels here on how you run a modern-day gold standard, much the way Britain ran its gold standard between the 18th and 19th centuries. And it can be done, uh, Jennifer, it can be done fairly easily, but it needs a mechanical rule that just guarantees that you know 10, 20 years from now that dollar will be worth about what it is today. And that's what you really need for contracts. Here's a question for Brian. There's a growing tolerance of Marxist ideas, which we all know has been a universal failure. How can we better educate American students and their parents on the detriments of socialist principles? Is capitalism a term that needs to be retired in favor of economic freedom or economic liberty, or more simply, Lafferism? <laughs> sure. Yeah, ca capitalism is a term, uh, etymologically, that we, we owe largely to Marxism. It probably existed uh, prior to Karl Marx and the writing of David Ricardo, but its currency uh, came about because of Marxism. Um, it's rare for free market writers and commentators to use that term. Jude Winiski did not prefer it. The Wall Street Journal rarely throughout its history has used that term. Market economics, free market economics, the economy. Um, you know, I, ha I have to say that uh, you know, I studied the history of Marxism quite a bit. Um, Marx was a, a nobody in the 19th century. Uh, there was a, a very intellectual century I mean, a hyper-intellectual century with you know, Hegel and Kierkegaard and Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and you know, so forth. Um, and Marx was a footnote in the 19th century. It didn't even have any, any notable political influence. It was the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 in Russia that uh, uh, 
caused all of Marx's significance. So we should be dismayed, very dismayed, if young people are in the thrall of Karl Marx because Marx owes all of his significance to one of the most uh, concerning events in all of uh, global history, that is the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, I think these things uh, wane when there is great, when the American dream is really in operation. Of course, young people in the population at large will be curious about the alternatives if the American dream is not functional. So the most important thing, I think, believe it or not, is this, the substance, is to get the economic policy right so that we have a booming economy, and you'll see the intellectual imagination follow. Can I just add to that one, one little thing there? Within a university, it is a Marxist system. People are not based, uh, are paid based upon their productivity and their right answers. They're based upon tenure, they're based upon whether they cause kerfluffles or not. So when you have the people teaching your students uh, not based on an economic system that you, by your, you yourself live by, don't expect different answers. You know, when if someone says, I'm a conservative professor at a university, that, that's like calling Banker's Trust or, uh, or Giant Shrimp or what, it, it's an, anyone who's a professor works in a system that is not a free market system. And it's very hard for them to teach students free markets when they themselves don't operate by them. All right, here's a, a question about the 2024 election. What presidential candidate in 2024 would most likely adopt your economic platform? And that's for either of you. In 2016, I think 12 of the candidates came to my office and wanted holy water dabbled on their plans and stuff. Well, no, but they do, and I, I worked with them. I worked with Trump very closely. I worked with Cruz. I worked with uh, all, all of them very closely. I've been just great guys. I think we have a lot of candidates who are very much into the way we're thinking. I mean, you can think of some of the things, medical transparency, price transparency. You're talking about low-rate, broad-based flat taxes, spending restraints. What you want to do is have impounding of funds so that these funds that were authorized are not spent over the next 25,000 years and cause the continuation of the problem. Uh, freer trade, we want freer trade, we want uh, less regulations, you know, I could go on and on and on, but there are about 20 of those that really need to be the pamphlet that would be the guiding light for the next administration after 2024. But don't hold your hopes up that this will happen quickly. Don't think that these pains are over quickly, they're not. And I'll just end with, with the comment here. In February of 1966, Brian alluded to this, the stock market in February of 1966 peaked, the intraday high was 1,000. In August 13th, 1982, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 777. In 16 and a half years, the value of America's capital stock had fallen by 22.3%. But that doesn't even can count for the trebling of the price level. In real terms, the index of 1,000 in Fe February 1966 was 235 on August 13th, uh, 1982. That is a decline of 76.5% in 16 and a half years. That's called a bear market, people. The average annual return on equities in real terms over that period was minus 7% per annum compounded annually. That's what really was. That's, and if you remember the depression of those days every day, but, but it just wore on you. Do you remember all those times? And you remember under Jimmy Carter and all that, I mean, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, which one of those makes you giggle and laugh and feel good about yourself? <laughs> None. You know, it was this depression. I, so what I want you to do is understand you're in it for a long haul. We will get it solved. It will happen. But it takes a long time for that to occur. You first got the midterm elections. Then we've got the, then we've got the, gen now I think it's good things are going to happen in the midterm, but that won't stop any of this. It won't replace any of it. Biden will still be president. That cabinet will still be the same. The Fed will still be the same. There'll be no differences there. They'll just be whacking at the pinata. Then after 2024, you'll get a new president, a new Congress. Then they'll put in new legislation. That'll come through and 25, and maybe in 26, you'll start seeing the major effects of these policies coming. So hold on to yourselves, be very careful. But the, as Larry Kudlow says, the cavalry is coming, but it's pretty far away. <laughs>
Okay, we, we saw the, the, the Keynesians in the 30s give bad advice, and the Neo-Keynesians give bad advice in the 1970s. What is the worst advice you see today being given to Biden and Congress? And this is for either of you. you it's hard to tell, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, you might say modern monetary theory. Um, um, that's, had, that's had quite a... <laughs> Quite a run. I mean, this is this is the kind of new newfangled uh, academic theory, uh, saying that the the government can you know, create and spend as much money as it wants because the dollar is the world's sovereign currency. Uh, and if there are any problems with that that might ensue, including inflation, the solution is to raise tax rates. Um, I think that idea had some pretty significant traction over the last few years, and now we're facing stagflation. So I'd, I'd probably nominate M MMT. Dr. Laffer, any additional? Well, I just want to point out that he's right. Uh, and it's the real problem here, I think, the advice is that they think the economy is going well. <laughs> Today, uh, the employment rate, employment in the U.S. is 800,000 jobs less than it was in February of 2020. They haven't even caught back up to where it was before the pandemic began, let alone the trend line. They're six billion off the trend line. GDP in the first quarter of this year was minus one and a half percent. That's the biggest downturn. I mean, in, for an economy in a long time. The second quarter was estimated by the uh, Atlanta Fed at 1.3%. They've now revised that down to 0.9%. So, you know, this is a really bad economy in every way, shape, and yet this guy goes up there and tells you, fastest growing thing in the world, in the world, in the world. Did you see that quote? I mean, what? It's just so wrong. I mean, it is wrong, wrong, wrong. I mean, I haven't had anything like that happen to me until one of my kids stole the candy. They just, they don't face reality, Jennifer, at all. And the first thing you need to do to, is, uh, for a problem is recognizing that you have a problem. And every alcoholic knows that. Recognizing that you are an alcoholic is the first thing critically necessary to solving. These guys don't, will not admit to any mistakes. <laughs> This is a good follow-up question on the president's economic ad advice and his economic plans, such as they are. In your opinion, who is the chief economic advisor to Joe Biden? Is it A, Jen Psaki, B, Brian Stelter, C, Jim Acosta, D, Hunter Biden, or E, the Easter Bunny? <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> I, you know, I think Ron Klain has a thing there. This is a very different brand that is very Marxist. His power is the end in its own right. And your obligation to the world is not to give it up or not to do a good job. It's just to maintain that power. And they are very good at doing that so far. But I think there's a shock coming out. But, you know, there, there's no limit to the amount of things they could do to try to upset this, this operation, that change happening. So, yeah, I mean, we're now in a land war in Europe. And what happened to W when he got into a land war in Asia? His popularity got way up and he did really well in the midterm elections. They were waiting for that bump to go to the polls and it, it hasn't shown up. I mean, look at what happened when the leak from the Supreme Court. I mean, they thought for sure that would be a bump and really ag agitate and organize their base. It hasn't happened. And you know, these are one after, now they've got a January 6th hearings going on. And you know, January 6th was a really bad day. I mean, a really bad day, everyone included. But you know, it's, it's not meant to be a movie two weeks before it happens. I don't know. Um, on the subject of political divisiveness, what can we do through public discourse to encourage moderation of policies and less polarizing leaders with the media having their thumb on the scale? Can we accomplish, uh, let's say, accomplish debate and solving problems instead of do nothingness? I guess what, what can we do to? Yeah. Well, the first thing is, what can you do here, at at uh, here at the institute? What can you do? Be straight. Be straight on every shot you do. Call them as you see them, but call them straight and don't waver from that. Don't get into the line of trying to do something that politically looks good or fashionable. All of us have a real obligation to be straight on all of these answers, not to be negative, not to be positive, not to be left-wing or right. With you guys, I did the, at the lunch, I did the, the theorem on 
on redistribution. Uh, you know, that's just straight math. You know, that, these are the things. And just keep calling. Sooner or later, uh, the electorate and politics will bring itself back to our way of thinking. It really will. We will not lose this, believe me. We may suffer a lot of losses for a lot of time, but we won't lose this one. And we won't, I was really depressed. I can remember being really depressed in the 1970s, thinking, here I am, an American, it's all gone. And then all of a sudden, Reagan came along. And here you are now, I was really depressed until about three or four or five months ago, and all of a sudden, bang, that's chant. The change in the political tenor of the nation today is so wonderful. And Jennifer, I just think what we do is just keep playing our, out, our stuff straight, be nice, kind, don't say bad words about people, but just call them as you see them. Don't, don't try to pander. Uh, don't try to kowtow to the other side. Oh, let me even, you know, call their shot, call the shots just as you would all the time. Um, Brian, I know you, you have talked before about Bitcoin and the, the rise of Bitcoin and how that's um, affecting the global economy. Um, and this, this question is involving the rise of China uh, as a global power. Do you want to talk about the rise of China as a global power and, and how Bitcoin is affecting um, the, the global economy and our economy? Is that having any effect on the inflation we're seeing now? Sure. I mean, I actually am wondering if um, if if the, the Bitcoin's travails uh, recently aren't aren't a primary cause of our our stagflation right now. Uh, in that, uh, the lesson I draw from the 1960s and 1970s is that the United States went off the classical monetary regime, and then you had stagflation. There seems to be there's a yearning publicly. There's been a a clear desire on the part of the public for a classical monetary system. And, and Bitcoin came on in, in 2009 and gained its popularity over the next number of years as an emblem of the creative destruction of the marketplace to seize an industry that was not performing as it should, a very important industry, that is the, the industry of currency creation and of the monetary system. So here was creative destruction coming from the most impressive quarter of the modern economy, tech saying, we're going to take over, we're going to privatize the monetary system. And I actually think that had something to do with the great bull market in stocks. Hey, great, you know, we don't have to wait for the government people to solve our monetary problems. But the private sector is going to do it. Now, I think maybe there's been some question about, well, maybe Bitcoin relies too much on, on the computer server system and other problems just intrinsic to Bitcoin itself. And I think it's led to a crisis of confidence within Bitcoin. And then people start to worry, well, wait a minute, we're not going to have a creative destruction and private takeover of a monetary system? We were banking on that because the government's never going to do it. So I just think there's this unbelievable yearning on the part of the global public for legitimate money. And if Bitcoin can't deliver it, where are we then? Because Joe Biden's president. And, you know, look who's in the Fed. So, yeah, I think those, those, two, those two phenomena go together. And as goes China... The greatest thing that ever happened to China was getting rich, and I think the United States should continue to encourage it and, and have pretty darn good economic relations with China. You know, what he thinks that the market wants is a money independent of political ploy. Yeah, real, real monetary power is soft power, not hard power. Uh, China has a very difficult time generating natural soft power throughout the world. People just naturally want everything China wants, you know, without threats. Uh, China specializes in hard power, not soft power. Uh, the greatest currencies have soft power. Why did the dollar rise to prominence? It wasn't because of hard power. It was because people love the American dream. That's why. And that's why everyone flocked to the dollar, because of the American dream. So uh, the United States really lost that power when the dollar depreciated. I mean, the dollar's you know, loss uh, against uh, the price level and gold uh, unceremoniously in the 1970s was no, no expression of global faith in the dollar. And that's when the American dream was waning. So I, I think the global monetary public wants uh, soft power money. Let's, let's end with a fun question. Dr. Laffer, in, in the book, um, there are some stories about when you, you used to visit Ronald and Nancy Reagan's home in California quite frequently. You apparently had some very entertaining dinners and some fun times there. Is there one story that really stands out that, that you would like to share with our audience to close? Can I... That, that dinner with the 
I'd pick Bill that, Simon? I'd pick the, uh, I would pick uh, maybe uh, the stole around the neck, the animal. Oh, that one. Okay, well, okay. <clears throat> the Reagans were over for dinner, uh, along with the, the Darts, and my, my godfather was Justin Dart, so the reason I was so close with Reagan is not because I earned his trust or anything. Uh, I got that relation by privilege, and I love it when I don't have to really work hard to get a good relationship. <clears throat> and we had, the, it was 1979, just the beginning of the campaign, and uh, Justin Dart and, um, and um, what, what, who's the auto guy? Um, Holmes Tuttle. Holmes Tuttle uh, were there. Uh, Jack Kemp was coming, and we had the Scharfenbergers. From, so it was a dinner party of about nine people, and I was a single father raising four kids at the time. And so my kids did all the serving there uh, for the meal, and in respect of their work and effort, uh, at the end of the meal, each of the kids is allowed to bring, I'm an animal collector like Matt, if some of you may know, I have all these weird animals, and uh, each kid is able to bring one of his animals or her animals in and talk about it to everyone there for a couple minutes, and then the next one does it. They get center stage for a few minutes, and each one of the kids, I think my eldest brought in one of the big turtles, we have giant turtles, and run them, bring in one of our macaws and whatever, and then my little one, Rachel, who was six years old at the time, brings in our ferret. Now we have a ferret. If you, do all of you know what a ferret is? It sort of looks like an elongated rat uh, with, with whiskers like this, you know, going like that. She brings, she's the cutest little thing, six years old. Hey, man, I want to show you my ferret, Fern, and Fern runs free and round it. So she walked in the table, and it, it looks a little disgusting, so she's going to each person there, and Nancy Reagan says, darling, please, that's very nice, but please don't, don't bring it near me. It makes my skin crawl. And with that, my daughter says, my daddy's always told me, if you're afraid of an animal, you should hold it. <laughs> I saw my future go before me. Nancy was just delightful that night. She, she grabbed the animal and said, no, darling, I really don't want to hold it. But, but for years after that, she'd say, and how's that awful little animal you have? And I'm not really sure whether she meant my daughter or the weasel. But... Final reminder, uh, we are going to have a book signing upstairs. If you have not yet bought your book, you can still do that. We have a nice reception in the May Gallery if you'd like to join us. You're welcome to join us for that. Please remember the Steamboat Institute in your charitable giving plans. We would love to have your support. Um, and I hope to see all of you at the Freedom Conference over here at the Park Hyatt, August 26th and 27th. Thanks so much for joining us tonight.